<laughs> Can you hear me okay? How is everyone today? Oh, super. I'm do doing super. Um, how's the pathology? Was that your first pathology lecture? Okay. okay. Yeah, good. Doc uh, Dr. Boyum's pretty cool. Okay, so today uh, the topic is, uh, I think this is the end of our carbohydrate metabolism. So we're going through uh, uh, two kind of esoteric aspects of carbohydrate metabolism and one that's uh, uh, extremely important. Uh, the fructose and galactose, I would say those are kind of, uh, you know, little uh, uh, side pathways. Pentose phosphate pathway is just hugely important in all cells in most conditions. Okay, um, so objectives are shown here. I think, you know, they're structured in a way that should be familiar to you by now. So uh, let me know if you have questions about them. Just referring back to lactic acidosis and glycogen storage diseases, this was kind of a, um, I, I'm not sure if I explained this very well, but, and it's not a, you know, hugely important uh, um, uh for you as first year medical students, unless you, you know, are wanting to go deep into inborn errors of metabolism. But generally the glycogen storage diseases, if, if the trap is going to make like free glucose or free glucose 6-phosphate, so that would be the case of like a, a glycogen synthase deficiency their glucose is going to go into the liver cell and it's not going to be able to make glycogen, so it's going to be like free glucose. Uh, likewise, with a glucose 6-phosphatase deficiency for von Gerke's disease, there you've got free glucose or glucose 6-phosphate that's trapped in the, the liver cell. So in cases where the, the trap is at the free glucose, and that glucose doesn't have any other metabolic fate besides glycolysis, then you can get lactic acidosis. Okay, if you would consider like debranching enzyme de deficiency, there the trap, it, it, it's trapped as glycogen, as the big polymer. Right, so there you don't have this buildup of excess um, free glucose, so there you're more likely to, you know, switch to a ketone body response. Okay, does that does that make sense? Yeah, I, I apologize if I didn't uh, um, explain that very well. And I'll put this slide in with the quiz, the clicker quiz slides for you. Are there other questions about glycogen metabolism or gluconeogenesis? Okay. Okay, so for outlining uh, today's lecture, first we'll talk about uh, fructose metabolism, then galactose metabolism, then pentose phosphate metabolism. Uh, then we'll talk about disorders of all three of them, and we'll conclude with a discussion of a clinical case uh, if we can uh, get to it. And the clinical case is initially shown here. Did you get a chance to... Take a look at this. Okay, keep this in mind as we're um, as we're going. I, I do have some review questions. If you'd like to activate your clickers, and these are just some pretty simple one-step questions for you. Okay, best answer is debranching enzyme. Um, so the the branching enzyme, we would describe that activity as a 4-6 transferase. It's breaking a 4-4 bond and making a new 1-6 bond. Or excuse me, breaking a 1-4 bond and making a new 1-6 bond. Okay, so let's look further into the debranching enzyme's enzymatic activity. OK, 
Okay, so we think of glycogen, phosphor, ooh, a lot of, a lot of confusion over that. Uh, glucose is the best answer here. So glycogen phosphorylase, that's kind of the, the main enzyme in glycogen breakdown, and that's using inorganic phosphates to turn the glycogen into glucose 1-phosphate. But then the branch points, when those are resolved, uh, that 1,6-glucosidase activity, that's what's removing the stump at the branch. That's making free glucose. Okay, so um, that would be a substrate for this next enzyme. All right, so we would need to add another ATP in order to uh, make it into a, a usable substrate. Gesundheit. Okay, ATP and glucose, best answer here. Okay. Okay, glucocorticoid receptor, that was the major regulator of phosphoenyl pyruvate carboxykinase expression, remember? And this is the same type of a receptor as the androgen receptor and progesterone receptor and thyroid hormone receptor and vitamin D receptor and did I say estrogen, progesterone? Okay, good. So ligand activated transcription factors. Um, these are also frequently referred to as steroid hormone receptors or nuclear hormone receptors. Uh, and they function by not acting at the plasma membrane, like, say, the glucagon receptor or the insulin receptor, but they're acting inside the cell. So the ligand, the hormone, such as glucocorticoid, that's diffusing into the cell, binding to the receptor, and then the receptor binds to DNA and transactivates transcription. This is a poorly structured question as I'm reading it now. Because the answer choices, you've got four things that are like very molecularly specific, and then one thing that's just a general process. So, and that, that one thing is the correct answer. <laughs> so it's, it's like the correct answer is kind of structured differently from everything else. So I'm trying to get better at my uh, question writing, but that's, uh, so should we? See what the correct answer is. Yeah, very good. So it's suppressing hepatic glucose outputs by um, uh, suppressing the expression of PEPCK and other gluconeogenic genes. Okay, so remember, diabetes is as much of a problem with excessive hepatic glucose outputs as it is with uh, dealing with the dietary carbohydrates. Okay, uh, are there questions? Okay, a lot of drama in the back hallway. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, begin our discussion of uh, fructose and galactose metabolism. So we'll talk about fructose first and then uh, galactose second. Um, so we don't have a lot of monosaccharide in our diet. Uh, we, so if we eat a lot of honey, honey is like the only really natural source of a monosaccharide, and that has a, a fructose in it. Uh, so where we get uh, our fructose and galactose principally in our diet is in the form of a disaccharide or two sugar 
monomers uh, joined together in a glycosidic bond. So lactose is the milk sugar, and that is a disaccharide of one molecule of glucose and one molecule of galactose. Uh, gal galactose. Sucrose, that is a fruit sugar or table sugar, that is a, a disaccharide of one molecule of glucose and one molecule of fructose. So when we ingest either of these sugars into our mouth, uh, in the lumen of our gut, there are enzymes that will break that glycosidic bond and will release glucose and galactose or fructose, depending on which of the sugars is there. Okay. So let's consider fructose first, and fructose metabolism is shown as a little shunt off of uh, uh, the left of glycolysis there. Uh, so, and I'll say with both fructose and, and galactose, um, they can be intersected into glycolysis. So they can be essentially interconverted with glucose and they can share all of the metabolic fates of glucose. They can be used for energy or uh, stored as glycogen or stored as a fatty acid. Okay, so the structure of fructose is as a keto sugar where glucose would be a aldehyde sugar. Uh, this, this carbon would be more oxidized in fructose, it's a, a ketone more internal to it. Um, so where we can get fructose, as I mentioned, we can eat it as a monosaccharide with honey. The majority of it comes from uh, sugar, from, from sucrose. We can also synthesize it de novo from glucose, uh, and the uh, this is most important in males and seminal vesicles as fructose is a, a nutrient for uh, sperm cells. It's also important in the vit vitreous humor of the eye. Uh, and in both cases, the, the pathway that generates fructose is called the polyol pathway. Uh, if we take a sugar that is an aldehyde sugar like glucose, um, the same pathway also functions on galactose and uh, that'll uh, uh, come into play uh, with one of the symptoms of a galactokinase deficiency that we'll uh, uh, talk about towards the end of the class. Anyways, the polyol pathway is converting the aldehyde into an alcohol, and then it's converting this alcohol into a ketone. Uh, so it's a, a reduction and then an ox and then an oxidation reaction. Um, so this is a pathway that can generate fructose de novo within uh, our own bodies. Uh, it doesn't do this as a nutrient you know, source. Um, it has some pathological consequences with the generation of sorbitol in the eye. This is a sugar that uh, is, you know, not abundant in our body naturally, and when it gets produced in the uh, in the eye, it can cause a osmotic imbalance and cause water rushing into the eye and cause increased uh, intraocular pressure. Um, these different intermediates of the polyol pathway, whether it's using galacto or glucose as shown or galactose uh, as not shown, this can also increase the glycation of proteins in the vitreous humor of the eye, and both of those things together can contribute to cataracts, oh, which is right here. Okay, so um, I think I said everything I'll need to say about that. Okay, so the, the de novo synthesis of fructose within our own body um, isn't really how uh, uh, we make most, or, or how we get most of our fructose. Most of our fructose is going to be ingested in the form of sucrose. Okay, so when we ingest sucrose, uh, there is an enzyme that's attached to the gut epithelial cells, um, but that has its enzymatic activity projected into the lumen of the gut. Uh, so the sucrase isomaltase complex one of its activities is to break down isomaltose, which is a product uh, of starch digestion. It has another enzymatic activity of breaking the disaccharide sucrose into fructose and, <coughs> and glucose. So once we get those monosaccharides generated, they are then uh, substrates for transport 
into the gut epithelial cells and then across the basolateral membrane of the gut epithelial cells and into the blood. Uh, so the major transporter for fructose is the GLUT5 transporter. Um, so sh shown here as GLUT2, GLUT we had talked about that as being restricted, its expression as being restricted to um, pancreatic beta cells and to cells of the liver. It's also expressed in the um, portion of the small intestine that's, let's see, proximal to the mouth or the, the, the early part of the small intestine where you're going to get high concentrations of carbohydrate. Uh, then you're going to get carbohydrate concentrations in the lumen that would um, uh, exceed the KD for the GLUT2 transporter and kind of get uh, transport in high car carbohydrate concentrations uh, situations. So I think I probably said GLUT2 expression is uh, restricted to the liver first, and then I said it was also in the pancreatic beta cells, and now I'm saying it's also in the uh, upper part of the small intestine. So, um, And you'll get more of that in year two in gastrointestinal medicine too. Um, let's see. So... The, the major transporter of fructose is the GLUT5 uh, transporter, uh, but we can also get GLUT2 transports uh, in that early part of the intestine. Um, once the fructose is in the rest of the body, um, then it will be taken up by GLUT5 primarily because fructose concentrations generally aren't going to, in the blood, aren't going to be high enough to go through uh, GLUT2. Okay. All right, so if we consider uh, if this is a liver cell, for example, the liver is normally the major site of fructose metabolism. Uh, so the first step of fructose metabolism recapitulates the first step in glucose metabolism, and that is the phosphorylation of the uh, uh, fructose. So there's a dedicated fructokinase enzyme that can make fructose 1-phosphate. Um, Fructose can also be phosphorylated by hexokinase, uh, but at a much slower rate. So hexokinase is, you know, is uh, its preferred substrate is glucose, but it can also act on uh, fructose. Okay, if we remember back, so, so the, the metabolic fate of fructose 1-phosphate then, that's going to intersect with glycolysis. Okay, if you recall, the fourth step of glycolysis was the aldolase reaction, where fructose 1,6-bisphosphate gets cleaved into the dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So all tissues exp express the aldolase A isoform, or the, the main aldolase, if you will, that has uh, specificity for the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Liver cells express a different isoform of aldolase called aldolase B, and aldolase B has additional substrate specificity for uh, oh, excuse me for fructose 1-phosphate. So aldolase B can cleave the fructose 1-phosphate into dihydroxyacetone phosphate and not glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, but glyceraldehyde. Uh, there is then a triose kinase enzyme in the liver that can make the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So um, the liver has this unique ability to um, use both fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and fructose 1-phosphate as glycolytic substrates. So once we have the, the triose phosphates generated, then they can go down the... Um, uh, the glycolytic pathway if the cell is in a energy consuming pathway or they can go uh, up the gluconeogenesis pathway. Um, so if we have, um, if we're doing a lot of work and using a lot of ATP, that fructose can be converted into glycolytic intermediates and then into pyruvate and acetyl-CoA and TCA cycle and, and, and so on to generate energy. Uh, if the, so that would be shown, let's see, here going down to the TCA cycle. In conditions where we eat fructose, um, 
generally we've got a lot of other carbohydrates around because you know we consume fructose in the context of also consuming a lot of glucose okay so this pathway is not generally the the preferred pathway or 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 would only be active when we're doing a lot of work. So the uh, fructose can be converted into um, glucose and stored as glycogen by going up into the gluconeogenesis pathway. Similar, and that, that's something that we've talked about um, Monday. Was it Monday? Okay. Then in about two weeks, we're going to talk about fatty acid uh, synthesis. And... So glycogen is one way that we can store excess carbohydrate energy, but we can also store excess carbohydrate energy as fatty acids. And by going into, dipping into the TCA cycle and making citrates, and then citrate leaving the mitochondria, the fructose can also be a substrate for fatty acid synthesis. So that is those two metabolic fates or, or different metabolic fates of the fructose are shown here. Um, so we can either go up through gluconeogenesis as a storage pathway. Um, we could also go through gluconeogenesis and just export this out of the liver as glucose if that was needed. And then as a, a oxidation pathway, we can go down to pyruvate and acetyl-CoA. And as another storage pathway, we can take that pyruvate and convert it into citrate and then use that as a substrate for fatty acid uh, synthesis. Okay, so this part, um, just kind of don't worry about all the different intermediates there. Just recognize that uh, in conditions of carbohydrate excess, pyruvate can be converted into fatty acids. Okay, so looking at our fructose catabolism, which major regulatory step in glycolysis is bypassed when we use a molecule of fructose. And I mean those major regulatory step in glycolysis, that's really all you need to know about this question, right? Okay. Okay, so PFK1 is the major regulatory step in glycolysis, and we have um, fructose entering into glycolysis at the aldolase step, so essentially we're independent of that important PFK1 one, uh, regulatory step, and that allows the, uh, the products of the aldolase reaction to, you know, go in either direction depending on the energy context and the hormonal context of the uh, of the cell. Okay, so most of the time uh, the fructose that we eat will be meta uh, yes? Sorry, doesn't it also then if it comes in at like four step, doesn't it miss out on the first step too? Like hexokinase? I mean, you said the hexokinase also plays a role. Oh, yes. Was that an answer choice? No, but yeah. for the sake of understanding. Yes. Yep. Uh, yeah, hexokinase could also uh, um, be, be an example here. But that's a good segue into um, the uh, next thing that I was going to mention is that, so fructokinase, that's the, that's the enzyme that has a, a low KM for fructose and can phosphorylate it very readily. Hexokinase, in addition to be able, being able to use glucose, it can also use fructose and generate the same product as fructo, fructokinase, the uh, fr fructose 6-phosphate. Uh, so hexokinase has a much lower KM for glucose than for fructose. So this route of metabolism is going to be slow compared to uh, the liver route using fructokinase. Okay. Are there questions about fructose? Okay, let's carry on and talk about galactose. Uh, galactose metabolism, um, again, this is a little offshoot of, of 
glyc of glycolysis, and it intersects with glycogen metabolism because they're both using UDP glucose as a common intermediate. Okay, um, so the metabolic fates of galactose in our body. We can oxidize it for fuel, we can use it for gluconeogenesis or store it as glycogen or fatty acids. There's another important fate of galactose that um, is not shared by fructose. Galactose can be used for uh, glycosylation reactions. So modifying a protein or a phospholipid, for example, with a chain of carbohydrates uh, and that those chains of carbohydrates, those are most important on um, proteins that are exported out of the cell or receptors that are sitting on the extracellular surface of cells. And they're very important uh, for um, the shape and function uh, of, of those proteins. For example, a uh, luteinizing hormone is a peptide hormone, and it's glycosylated, so it, it makes a carbohydrate chain that involves galactose uh, subunits. If that carbohydrate chain isn't there, then the hormone has very low half-life in uh, circulation, and it also can't make the right interactions with the luteinizing hormone receptor. Okay, so just a... a and the consequences of that are not, you know, uh, insignificant. That would mean that somebody who had that disorder wouldn't ever go through puberty, essentially. Okay, so so pretty uh, significant consequences. Um, and some disorders of galactose metabolism can manifest as uh, like a glycogen storage disease. disease. Others can manifest as uh, delayed growth and failure to enter puberty and other kind of more endocrinological uh, 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 phenotypes. Okay, so kind of getting out of myself here. Let's look at uh, where galactose is in our diet. So the or or, or where it is in relation to other metabolic pathways. Um, so UDP galactose. This is um, this can be synthesized within our bodies from UDP glucose or we can make UDP galactose from dietary galactose. But making UDP galactose from dietary galactose requires UDP glucose. Okay, so it's kind of a, a, a somewhat of a complicated pathway. Um, UDP glucose is shown here. This is, of course, we've talked about this being a uh, important substrate for glycogen synthase and making glycogen. UDP glucose is also important for these uh, glycosylation reactions. Not shown here, but UDP galactose is essential for these same kind of glycosylation reactions. Okay. All right, so let's see. We can synthesize um, um, galactose within our bodies and we're mammals, right, and the hallmark defining characteristics of mammals is the ability to synthesize lactose and to um, excrete it to a suckling infant through the mammary glands. Um, so the lactose um, um, that we're first exposed to uh, uh, in our diet is generally man-made lactose or, or human-made um, lactose. Um, so some of the disorders of carbohydrate metabolism can be distinguished from when they uh, are coming on. If you have a disorder in galactose metabolism, that's likely to hit right away after an infant is born because the infant is using, uh, is using lactose as its principal carbohydrate source. And a disorder in fructose metabolism, that's not going to happen generally or not going to manifest until an infant is uh, weaned off of milk sugar and starts to eat more table sugar. Okay, so just a little, uh, little clue uh, to distinguish these uh, conditions. Okay, again, I think I'm uh, getting all out of order here. All right, so within the mammary gland, we can synthesize lactose using UDP galactose as a, a substrate for the um, glycosyl transferase enzyme uh, 
excuse me, lactose synthase. So this is taking UDP galactose and glucose and transferring the galactose off of the nucleotide and onto the glucose to make the disaccharide uh, lactose. This then um, is exported into the lumen of the uh, milk ducts and effluxed out into the, through the nipple and is taken up by the uh, infant. And then in the gut of the infant, there is an enzyme called lactase. So similarly to the sucrase isomaltase complex, this uh, lactase enzyme is um, bound to the gut epithelial cells that are lining the lumen of the gut, but the enzymatic activity is projected out into the lumen of the gut. Okay, so that lactase is going to cleave the lactose into galactose and glucose. The um, um, galactose then can be transported through the uh, SGLT system or the sodium linked glucose transporter, uh, secondary active transporter. Did we discuss that or did somebody else discuss that? Okay, um, so this is a sim porter that's transporting a sugar in um, a, a concert with a sodium atom. So the SGLT system, this can take a, a, um, a sugar and transport it from this side of the membrane onto this side of the membrane, and it can do it irrespective of the relative concentrations of sugar on one side of the membrane or another because the driving force is coming from a sodium gradient. The sodium gradient is generated by a sodium potassium pump that's actually hydrolyzing ATP and using energy to make a sodium gradient. Okay, Has, I, I thought you'd hear that from uh, somebody besides me, but um, yes. Yeah, we talked about it in your uh, acetyl-CoA, the glycolysis, Fatty acid oxidation. Okay. We about it. Okay. Okay. So you'll hear it. I think uh, you'll hear it over and over again. It's it's pretty critical. So the 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 um, inside of a cell is you know very low sodium concentration, high potassium concentration relative to the outside of the cell, and that's used to drive a lot of transport. Okay. So. Uh, let's see, galactose can be transported into the cell through the SGLT system, and this can, um, can essentially concentrate galactose within a gut epithelial cell. The um, galactose that's going through the uh, uh, GLUT2 transporters, that is only going to be, um, that's like a facilitated diffusion, so that can only go down the concentration gradient. Okay. So once galactose is um, in the uh, circulation, um, like the uh, situation with fructose, the major organ that's metabolizing galactose is going to be the liver. And like fructose, there is a dedicated kinase that uses galactose as its preferred substrate. Uh, so galactokinase is going to take a phosphate from ATP and make galactose 1-phosphate. So the fate of galactose 1-phosphate then, this is where it's intersecting with uh, glycogen metabolism. The um, galactose uridyl transferase enzyme, or galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase enzyme, this is going to take a molecule of UDP glucose, and we can get UDP glucose uh, from that uh, those early steps in glycogen metabolism, the UDP glucose synthase enzyme. Um, it's the transferase enzyme is taking the UDP from UDP glucose and swapping it out to make glucose 1-phosphate and then the galactose goes on to the nucleotide. So galactose goes to UDP galactose and then the glucose goes to glucose 1-phosphate. Glucose 1-phosphate, this then can be isomerized to glucose 6-phosphate and used for glycolysis, or it can be um, substrate for glucose 6-phosphatase and make glucose and export it out of the, the liver, or it can be used for fatty acid synthesis or you know multiple potential metabolic fates for the glucose 6-phosphate. Okay, so if we have glucose 6-phosphate here 
consumed by some process, let's just say glycolysis, and we've got more galactose coming into the cell, in order to sustain this pathway, we need more UDP glucose. Okay, so where we get UDP glucose in this uh, context is from UDP galactose. There is an epimerase enzyme that can interconvert UDP galactose and UDP glucose. Uh, so this is changing the you know stereochemistry of the uh, uh, of the sugar carbons, and this is a reversible reaction. And kind of the which way it's going to go is just going to be depending on the relative concentration of the substrate and the product. Okay, so um, if we have galactose coming in, we can make glucose 6-phosphate, and then the UDP glucose that's necessary here, this just keeps being regenerated through the ep epimerase uh, um, enzyme. Okay. All right. So that's shown in a figure from, from Marx here. Um, Disorders in galactose metabolism, well, there's, there's a um, lactase deficiency that we'll, we'll discuss, but uh, there are conditions called galactosemias, and the hallmark there is increased uh, galactose in the blood. And those are some inborn errors of metabolism in this pathway. Um, and so galactokinase deficiency, this is the non-classical galactosemia and is not uh, so serious. Um, the classical galactosemia is either the transferase deficiency or the epimerase deficiency. Those are much more uh, severe conditions. Okay. Any questions on galactose metabolism? Yes. transferase is the UDP getting exchanged and like the phosphate on the galactose one phosphate are they like exchanging or is it through the epimerization that like the lactose one phosphate becomes a glucose one phosphate so the epimerization that's like taking a nucleotide conjugated sugar and then changing the specificity of the the sugar carbons without breaking the bond between the nucleotide and the, the sugar. But the transferase enzyme, that, let's see, I can read it here. So the galactose here is going on to this nucleotide. And this gl glucose is becoming the glucose 1-phosphate. Is that, is that clear? OK. Yes? What percentage of like the, uh, I guess, glucose that we end up using uh, is from like galactose and lactose in our diet versus like um, other forms of I think it's going to be dependent on how much lactose you eat. Yeah. You know, I drink a ton of milk, so probably higher for me. Most people my age hardly drink any milk, so it's probably going to be lower for them. Um, yeah, I think it's just, it's going to be dependent on your, your diet. Yep. Yes? Um, so is that galactose 1-phosphate irritable transferase, is that, um, it, it's irreversible? Yes, that is an irreversible. Yes, yep, that's an irreversible. It's kind of like locks it into the cell. Is that similar? Does it, does it lock it into the cell similar to like hexapenase? Kind of the, the, this phosphorylation traps it into the cell. So yeah, the, the phosphorylated sugars aren't substrates for any of the glute transporters. Okay, let's uh, just do a couple easy clicker questions and then we'll segue into a discussion of the pentose phosphate pathway. Okay, very good. Milk.
Okay, UDP galactose. Glycosylation, sort of a glycosyl transferase sometimes. So that addition of carbohydrate chains onto proteins or phospholipids. Okay. Um, oh, and these are critical important reactions. They're not like using a ton of galactose like a you know fuel metabolism, but they're important for our health. Okay. And that's gonna that's going to come back in our discussion of the galactosemias. Okay. okay, shall we talk about the pentose phosphate pathway for a few moments? Okay. All right, so pentose phosphate pathway is just east of glycolysis. Uh, and uh, the pentose phosphate pathway is critical for all cells, I think it's fair to say. And generally about 10% of the glucose 6-phosphate that's uh, generated from hexokinase within a cell is going to be diverted into the pentose phosphate pathway. Okay. The, so, so the substrate, the basic substrate for the pentose phosphate pathway is glucose 6-phosphate. And the products of the pentose phosphate pathway, NADPH, uh, so reducing power in the form of NADPH is essential for uh, detoxification reactions, biosynthesis reactions, antioxidant reactions. Okay, so, so that's one of the key products of pentose phosphate pathway. And then five carbon sugars. Uh, so ribose uh, sugars are used for nucleotide synthesis. So those are kind of the main uh, pathways that are supported by the pentose phosphate pathway. But cells can use different components of the pentose phosphate pathway depending on what they need. Okay, if you think of a, uh, a cancer cell, that's going to be a rapidly dividing cell. So it's going to be using pentose phosphate pathway primarily for making the ribose sugar and the, the nucleotides because of elevated uh, nucleic acid synthesis. Other cells don't really have any requirement for nucleic acid synthesis, but they have high uh, antioxidant defense needs, so they're going to be using just, just parts of the pentose phosphate pathway. Okay. Um. I think that I talked about the stuff in blue already. So pentose phosphate pathway is important in all cells, but some cells have um, a greater need for it, either because they have a greater biosynthetic capacity, and that would be the case of, say, the lactating mammary gland that we just talked about. Uh, that, in addition to lactose, being synthesized, there's also a lot of fatty acid synthesis happening, um, and that requires uh, um, uh, NADPH as reducing power. Uh, the liver, that's our primary organ for detoxification reactions, so that has a higher requirement for a pentose phosphate pathway. Uh, red blood cells, red blood cells carry oxygen around, and they also have iron, uh, so they're big sources of oxidative stress or they're very susceptible to oxidative stress. So they have a high requirement for pentose phosphate pathway for antioxidant reasons. Okay, so different compartments or uh, uh, different tissue compartments are using different functions of the pentose phosphate pathway. Okay, so further to those different functions of the pentose phosphate pathway, uh, it's divided into two phases. Uh, so this is kind of a cartoon summary showing the whole thing with glycolysis uh, happening on the left here and then the pentose phosphate pathway on the right. So the two phases are referred to as the oxidative phase and the regenerative phase. So the oxidative phase, that is performing an oxidative decarboxylation of the glucose 6-phosphate. Uh, through two steps, it's trans transforming the 6-carbon uh, glucose 6-phosphate into the 5-carbon ribulose 5-phosphate and generating a molecule of carbon dioxide. Uh, in this process, you're getting, so it's a three enzymes that are doing this, and two of them are redox enzymes that are generating reduced NADPH. Okay. So this oxidative phase, um, the main product is the ribulose 5-phosphate and the NADPH. 
this is an irreversible step. So, you know, in conditions in our body, um, you'll never go from ribulose 5-phosphate and be uh, um, oxidizing NADPH to go to uh, glucose 6-phosphate. Um, so the oxidative phase then is in contrast with the regenerative phase. So the regenerative phase is taking the ribulose 5-phosphate and it's converting it into things that the body can use. Okay, so the things that the body can use are ribose 5-phosphate, and that can be then converted into uh, phosphoribosyl pyrophosphates and then used as a substrate for nucleotide biosynthesis. So in a cell that is rapidly dividing, say, replicating its DNA, it's going to be making uh, ribose 5-phosphate and phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate and et cetera uh, in nucleotide biosynthesis. In a cell that doesn't have a need for uh, nucleotides, the ribose five, or excuse me, the ribulose five phosphate is converted into intermediates of the glycolytic pathway. Okay, so what are intermediates of the glycolytic pathway? Well, they're all either six carbon molecules or three carbon molecules, right? So the regenerative phase, like th these enzymes, these are all about just using simple math to take a five carbon molecule and turn it into either a three carbon or a six carbon molecule. Okay. Um, so the reactions of the regenerative phase are all reversible. Uh, and the context or, or the, the consequence of that is that we can get ribose or excuse me, we can get ribose 5-phosphate for nucleotide synthesis from glycolytic intermediates independently of the, pento, of the oxidative phase of the pentose phosphate pathway. Okay. Okay, so let's look at the oxidative phase first. Uh, the first enzyme uh, in the uh, oxidative phase is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. And this is our first uh, uh, step where we're getting the reduction of NADP to NADPH. And the product is the 6-phosphoglucano uh, delta, lac delta lactone. It's a mouthful. The 6-phosphoglucano delta lactone is then hydrolyzed or, or uh, hyd hydrolyzed. Uh, by the addition of water, and then the 6-phosphogluconate dehydrogenase is the second oxidative step where we get reduction of NAD, uh, to NADP to NADPH, and then the carboxylic acid here comes off as carbon dioxide to make the ribulose 5-phosphate. So just to summarize the oxidative phase, we've got a 6-carbon glucose 6-phosphate, that's becoming a 5-carbon uh, ribulose 5-phosphate. The one carbon comes off as carbon dioxide, and we've got two NADPHs uh, reduced as a, uh, as a result. Okay. Um, so one of the major functions of the uh, oxidative phase is well, okay, the, the, the major products of the oxidative phase are the 5-carbon sugar and the NADPH. One of the major uses of the NADPH is for antioxidant defenses. And how NADPH contributes to antioxidant defenses is through a molecule called glutathione. So I'm going to talk about that shortly. Um, glutath or right now, glutathione, wait, what time is it? Oh. Maybe we should take a break, huh? Sorry, lost track of the time there. Any questions before we go to glutathione? Okay, let's resume at 11.01.